we will begin. Good evening, and thank you all for making time to join us. I am Josh London with the Anglo-Israel Association. For those less familiar with us, the AIA is a long-established UK organization aimed at providing information and education about Israel to a broad audience, including to those of all faiths and none. This evening's event follows on from our previous Zoom with Dr. Tal Becker, which gave us an introduction to the Israeli government's proposals on judicial reform, which, of course, proved controversial within Israel as well as abroad. Against this backdrop, we present this evening's conversation. We are grateful and honored that Lord David Wilson of Tradiga and member of Knesset Simcha Rotman have taken time out of their very busy schedules to come together in Jerusalem for this conversation. Before we, we begin, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. As time permits, we will try to address as many of these as possible. Without further ado, Lloyd Wolfson, David, you have the floor. Uh, good evening um, from Jerusalem and welcome to this webinar hosted by the uh, Anglo-Israel Association. I'm David Wolfson, I'm a barrister in the UK uh, and I also sit as a conservative peer uh, in the House of Lords and I was the justice minister there uh, until I resigned uh, topically for tonight on rule of law issues. Uh, in what became known as Partygate. Uh, but you haven't tuned in to hear me, you've tuned in to hear our esteemed guest, uh, Simcha uh, Rotman. And Simcha, if we can use uh, first names, he's also, like me, a lawyer and a politician, uh, although unlike me, he's actually been uh, elected. Uh, he was first elected uh, to the Knesset in 2021 uh, after being placed fourth on the list uh, of the religious Zionist party, which went on to win six seats. And for those watching uh, from the UK in particular, Israel, of course, has a PR system based on party lists. So no individual MK is personally elected by any group of voters. You vote for a party uh, and you get whoever the party has put on the list. Uh, but relevantly for uh, this evening, uh, Simcha is now the chair of the Constitution, Law and Justice Committee uh, of the Knesset which has uh, spearheaded uh, the controversial, I don't think it's controversial, but they are controversial, uh, reforms uh, in the judicial uh, space. Like me, I should also say Simco is on Twitter, uh, and um, I recommend uh, that you all follow his feed, even if you disagree uh, with what he is saying. So thank you very much for agreeing uh, to have this conversation. It's not a debate, it's not an interview, uh, it's, a, it's a conversation. Uh, we're meeting um, on an evening where there are, are another group of demonstrations uh, taking place, large demonstrations. Uh, tonight, there's a big demonstration in Tel Aviv pro the judicial uh, reforms. Uh, in the past few weeks, to get a scale of what's been happening here, there's been uh, demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of people uh, on the streets, about 4% uh, of the population in UK terms. Uh, that might be about 3 million uh, people uh, on the street. And we'll come to the proposed reforms uh, in a moment. But, but let, me start, let me start with this, given how the situation is now. The hundreds of thousands of Israelis demonstrating in the streets, the high-tech entrepreneurs, the venture capital fund managers, the Histadrut trade union leaders, the directors of the banks, the reserve air force pilots, the former defense minister, European heads of government, and indeed the US president himself. Are they all wrong to be worried about the future of Israeli democracy under your proposals? Um, first, yes. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the long answer is, you mentioned large groups in Israel that are very well, the rich and the connected, if you want, uh, um, you can define them. Um, they might be worried that for the first time in Israeli history, uh, the fact that they are rich and they are connected would not be enough for them to rule the country. They would actually need to get people to vote for them. Um, and that's because judicial, judicial reform 
But the change in the judicial system in Israel is coming after 30 years of an unjust justice system, of a justice system that self elects itself, um, of an unchecked and unbalanced court. We have all the power, zero democratic accountability, where you go to election and it doesn't matter if you vote right or left, you will always get what the Supreme Court judges want. Doesn't matter what the laws that you can legislate, doesn't matter how many people you convince. You were talking about demonstrations, and there were some large demonstrations. I think some of the numbers were exaggerated by the media, again, rich and connected. But the second people understood that there is a chance that the reform might be delayed or, uh, or, uh, or God forbid, canceled, in 10 hours, with zero organization, with zero infrastructure, with zero budget, with zero publication. There were more than 150,000 people that came to demonstrate in Jerusalem in a second, because most of the time they did not go and demonstrate because they thought the government is doing exactly what it was allowed to do. So there is no need to demonstrate for the government in a democratic country. You never vote or in the like government, there is no need. They were elected, let them do their stuff. So the fact that the war demonstrations, which was because Prime Minister Netanyahu were thinking about postponing the judicial reform. That's to show you where the public sentiment in Israel is. But aside the outcome of the elections, where the vast majority voted for the well, it's the vast majority. I mean, in the last election, um, there were 4.8 million votes cast, uh, and the rightist parties got 30,000 more votes than the leftist parties. Now, they get, they get a lot more seats because various parties didn't reach the threshold, but the actual division of votes wasn't... I mean, the truth is that Israel is pretty split no. when it comes to votes. No, it's not, because there are some parties that are not part of this game, and not because... You don't like them because they don't. Um, the Arab parties in Israel put aside for a second the Ram, which is the Muslim Brotherhood branch, which is a different problem. But Balad says openly, I'm not part of your game. The reason they were splitting for the other Arab parties is out of anger of the other Arab parties being a part of it. Um, so, so can the left, does the left wants to count them as part of their block when they are the one who said we will never have a government with them? So suddenly when you want to call, uh, call them as part of uh, your block, then suddenly their vote counts. On the, uh, and also last government, Hadash Tal, another Arab party, was not part of the coalition, was part of the opposition. Suddenly, they became part of Yair Lapid list. It's it's a cynical way to look at the Arab votes. The Arab votes in Israel have different issues and different problems that they are dealing with, have nothing to do with the judicial reform. And also, keep in mind, with large numbers and many Knesset that are now in the opposition, if I would I suggested to them, I will take every last bit of legislation that you offered in the past, I offered one of the opposition members, and I will sign it, and I will pass it. Do you agree? He said no. So it's not about objecting to the judicial reform. Matan Kahana and Zev Elkin, members of uh, an opposition party, Machanel and Mufti, their offers in the past were way more extreme than what I am offering now. So either they support it or they are against it, but nothing to do with the fact that they're part of the opposition. Let's have a look at some of the reforms, because I do think there's two ways to approach this. I mean, one is to look at the current position. And it seems to me as an outsider that there are quite a lot of criticisms you can justifiably make about the current position. Um, and the real question may be not whether any reform is required, but what sort of reform is required? 
So let, let's have a look at some of the reforms, which have, I think outside Israel certainly provoked the most discussion. So let's start with the appointment of judges. Now, um, as I understand it, um, under the current system, judges are appointed by a nine member panel uh, on which politicians are in the minority. Um, the government, I think, has three, the opposition has one, uh, and you need seven out of nine to be elected. So that basically gives the judges on the panel, uh, on the committee, together with the bar representatives uh, on the committee, a very strong uh, say. Uh, the proposal, uh, again, as I understand it, uh, there have been various changes, is to increase the committee from nine to 11. The number of politicians goes up, the number of non-politicians goes down, so that politicians have a clear majority, and the committee would decide by a simple majority. So essentially what that means is that politicians uh, would appoint the judges. Now, I mean, I'm a practicing lawyer. I think I would win nearly all my cases uh, if I could select the judges uh, who would hear particular cases. Um, and isn't this really an attempt to stack the cards in favour of the government by uh, politically appointed judges. What exactly the way um, judges were elected in Britain until 2013? So until 2013, in the British uh, model, we had the position where there was an informal committee which uh, recommended to the Lord Chancellor and I mean, as you know, the Lord Chancellor in the British Constitution was a very strange beast because the Lord Chancellor wore three hats. He was Speaker of the House of Lords, historically, uh, head of the judiciary, although sometimes not even a lawyer after 2005, uh, and also in the cabinet. And what we have now. And were you a democracy until 2013? You, you can, you can, this isn't a question. I'm not so. No, no, no. What I'm, what I'm, what I'm, it's about checks and balances in the democracy. Well, did you have checks and balances yes. until 2013? Yes. How come? Because if you were able to select your judges, if the Lord, if the Lord Chancellor that was part of the government, yes. also part of the parliament, and passed over to the House of Lords, was able to select the judges. That he would win all the cases. No? no, no, he did not win all the cases. Why? Because the fact that you select the judge after you select him is independent and he's not doing whatever he wants. Now, he, if you cannot change all the court at one time, then you have to deal with judges that were selected by the previous people who held your position. That's why when Trump and his Republican uh, um, Senate, appointed judges, he appointed 300 judges. He brought his cases in front of 15 judges and the outcomes of the elections, he lost all 15 all cases. So the fact that he appointed the judges did not make him win the case. So apparently something is wrong with the equation that you said. And that's the case in all most democratic countries. Now, since 2013, you have a little different uh, system. But still, your courts cannot cancel the legislation that was passed by the parliament. They can say, uh, they can issue a non-compliance or whatever. It's contrary to the European Convention of Human Rights. Yeah, yeah. but they cannot cancel. That's right. In Israel, the situation today that you have in courts that can self-perpetuate, unchecked and unbalanced, that can cancel laws based on no constitution whatsoever, because we don't have a constitution, wide understanding of what does it mean to cancel laws, even cancel basic laws for some reason, which I do not understand fully. And the, you cannot change the court ever. Now, even if this government would have four, four years, this government would be able to appoint only four out of the 15 judges. You cannot take over the court with four out of 15 judges. So if, either Israel, uh, for many years, I thought that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. What I discovered in the past two months is that Israel is the only democracy in the world, apparently, because all other democracies appoint their judges in the democratic with politicians dealing with them. And in Israel, apparently, if you do it, you become undemocratic. But, it, but the objection isn't that politicians play a part. Ah, the, the objection is surely that politicians have the uh, total control of the committee. You can appoint you can appoint judges straight to the apex court, straight to the high court, 
And the proposal also is that you can appoint the chief justice again, who need not be a judge again. again. We like might in the US. No, no, it, it isn't like in the yes. US. It isn't. No, because in the US, the executive can propose, but the Senate as a whole has to confirm. And here you have. They, I, that your proposal is not that the Knesset as a whole no, it's will, not, will, the, will, will confirm, is it? It's only in the committee. The committee is made of Knesset members. Right, but, but, but in the US, you have a Senate has to confirm. And also in the US, the US court can ultimately does have the final say as to whether an act is constitutional so, or not. So I'm saying, so, no, that's the second. Yeah. Uh, Carry on. So, so first in the US, out of the last 15 judges, 12 were appointed when the president and the, and the Senate were in control of a, of a single party. So you have judges who, so either you think that once you are part of a coalition, you are committed to vote on whatever the coalition is like, it doesn't matter how many people like it's one vote. If if that what you think, then is that what you think about the majority in the Senate? Or then what do you think about the president? So once the Republican Party doesn't matter through the through the president or through the Senate appoints, then it's the case. But in the US is again only one example. You have in Canada where the prime minister appoints judges. You have in New Zealand where yeah. the where the justice minister appoints judges. You have in you have in Ireland. You have in Sweden. You have in all most yeah, all yeah. democratic countries. Now to say that Israel is unlike any other country, it's it's doesn't mean anything because also the UK is unlike any other country, and no other country is like, unlike any other country. So it's meaningless to say that because it's it's true for any other country. But the problem is though, what you're doing is you're cherry picking. But so in Canada, for example, you pick Canada. So uh, Canada is a federal state. Okay. It's got 11 legislative institutions okay. with a federal party. But it has to do You've with the got, Let me just finish. You've got two, two houses in Parliament. The federal law must, must be passed by the House of Commons and the Senate. The members of the Senate are appointed and not elected. And therefore, like in the House of Lords, there's no populist mandate or no populist concerns. Uh, and frankly, also, Canada has got a constitutional tradition dating back 150 years. Ah, so if we're talking about the tradition, I think the Israel... No, I'm not talking about that. Look, okay. What I suggest the problem is, is that you're treating constitutional approaches like a butter. No, I'm not. And you're taking a bit from no. here, a bit from here, a bit no, from I'm here. Not. And you end up with a, with a chulant, which doesn't um, taste particularly um, good. I bet they're different. There is no democratic country where judges are self-elected. Uh, it's it, it, you, you. If you say, I'm just not, a second. I'm not justifying the that, that's, that's, that, that, that's what you do. That's what you do. Because when you say that Israel has, you can say that you need to have two houses for a functioning democracy. No, you don't. Okay, so you don't. Uh, you need. You might say that you need to have a federal system for a functioning democracy. No, you don't. You need to have checks and balances. Uh, you need to have checks and balances. Where's the check and the balance uh, under okay. your proposals? So in Israel, you have. A uh, system minority can get into the parliament, unlike the UK. In the UK, you can have three million people vote to a party, and yet they won't have any seat in parliament. Why? Because of the system of the first path to bar. In 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 Israel, every minority has representation in the parliament. Yeah, you get and you four percent over three yeah. point three point two five. Yeah. yeah. Um, but and that's uh, too high if you yeah. if you ask me. But still, it's it's a good enough number, and. Every minority has representation in the parliament. Every vote in the parliament counts. And opposition has a lot of power in Israel, in, within the parliament and outside the parliament. No, but but, but the parliament I, is just weak. a second. The just, parliament is weak because the moment you've got so the parliament is weak, well, and your solution for a weak parliament is to get an undemocratic court self-elect no. to cancel every legislation this weak parliament passes. Not at all. Uh, so so how come? This became a justification for an unelected, unchecked, and unbalanced court. Is that what I don't understand? Yeah. You, you, can, you can criticize the Israel system as much as you want. You probably can criticize it even better. It doesn't really matter. Because if the solution for problems in Israeli democracy is to get a dictator that will decide everything for us, then I, I, I'm I against your solution. But that, but that isn't my solution. Uh, no, but that is the solution today for Israel. Right, but it, no, no, it isn't. It's the court in Israel has it zero is accountability. So let me, let me explain, let me explain. The, I mean, the, in the, let's, take, let's take the parliament. I mean, in the, in the UK parliament, for example, 
which is one I know best. In the House of Commons, the government has a majority. By definition, the government is the party which has a majority in the House of Commons. Despite that, on occasion, it can be quite difficult for the government to get its legislation through even the House of Commons. Why? Because even if you whip your own MPs, your payroll vote, i.e. the ministers and the parliamentary private secretaries, are a small proportion of the government vote. Then you've got to get the legislation through the House of Lords, where the government never has a majority. Never have, no, no party has a majority in the House of Lords. In Israel, by contrast, at the moment, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, there are 120 members in the Knesset. The coalition, I think, is 64, of which 36 are ministers or deputy ministers. How many? A lot less because we have this Norwegian. Model. Well, the Norwegian, model, but, but that's just the way of flipping people backwards and forwards. No, it's not. The, the Israeli, the Israeli Knesset. See, if, again, if you were to say, see, if you were to say, I have in to order say, for the Knesset, you can decide the system in Israel as much as you want. I don't see how it's relevant when the solution is to have a philosopher king decide everything for well, the But who's proposed that as a solution? Because that's, that's the situation today. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not Unless, so, so I'm, uh, so to, you, you can deal with a lot of problems in the Israeli system. How come a court who is unelected, unchecked, unbalanced, appoints itself is a solution? It's not. So let's remove the problem with the court. And the fact that we have other problems that some of them I might agree with you, some of them I might disagree with you, because you said the parties that has a majority in Israel, you need a coalition. But the premise is wrong. Your premise is wrong about the parliament, but it doesn't really matter. Let's say it's true. How come a court that has zero accountability, zero democracy, uh, uh, all the powers in the world, and no checks and no balance is a solution? It's not. So, so, and, and if you want to argue about the problem in Israel parliamentarian system, I can argue a little bit about the problems in the British system. I can it's, argue about the uh, You can the argue. So let's let's. Be, I, I think it's. I think. I think it's. It's. It's not fruitful discussion because because a every system has its problems. There is no perfect system. No perfect system. But definitely, you wouldn't. I wouldn't. You wouldn't accept the fact that you have a problem with your parliament. Um, by the way, minorities are not represented well in your parliament. That's a problem. So let's have a court that can cancel all the legislation in your parliament by its own agenda without being elected or being uh, accountable. Would you accept this kind of arrangement for the UK because you have a problem that minorities are not well represented in your parliament? No, you wouldn't. And no, no other yeah. democratic country will but accept this. You and I agree with, about parliamentary sovereignty. I mean, we are both big fans of parliamentary sovereignty. Okay, absolutely. So, but but the question is: so let's look at judicial review. So, I think this is what we're getting onto: an ability of a court to cancel legislation or to strike down decisions of ministers. No, well to say. No, no, I appreciate it. exactly. They're, they're they're two different things. Absolutely. Now, as I understand it, under the proposal, um, the courts um, would be able to um, to have judicial review. Um, but I think originally you proposed that the full court would have to sit at 15 and all judges would have to vote in favour. I think now the proposal has been modified. That 80%. 12 have to vote. I must say, I found the idea that all would have to vote in favour quite unusual because, of course, in Jewish tradition, a Sanhedrin, which uh, where every single judge found the defendant guilty, he would actually be acquitted uh, because there's always something to be said on the other side. But now we've gone down to 80%. But in the jury system, in some, in some places in the US, I don't know what the case in the UK. 10 2. 10 2. 10 2. So yeah. it's more like yeah, what, yeah, what we propose. Yeah. In some places, it's you need to be but an then, unanimous vote. But then when it goes to the Knesset, as I understand it, if the Knesset wants to override the decision, no special majority is required there. 61 59 would be enough. That's right, isn't it? You have to understand. But that's right, what, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But um, by the way, the 10, 20, 80% is not uh, as unusual as if you want to go to the jury example, but it's I know in courts. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's, it's where, where else is that? I just learned yesterday that in Mexico also they have it. Oh, so you see, so um, your, your but, best example of that is Mexico. No, no. In, so you, in what other, in what but, other Western but, state of democracy but, do you have that? In, in what other court? Western, in, one, uh, in what other Western democracies judges select themselves? In what other Western democracies 
What, no, you, you no, 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 no. But what you're doing is <laughs> what you are doing is cherry picking. No, I'm not cherry picking. Really? Because yes, I'm sorry. You're very because... focused on the selection. Of mm, no, for you that's the main thing. First, it's the main thing. But you, what you're doing is cherry picking because Israeli court is unlike any other court in the world. Any other court in the, world, in the powers that he had, and you ignore this. You say. Oh, but you, this is not the way it's done in the UK. This is not the but way where, it's done. But where's the checks and balances? Yeah, but where actually, are the checks and balances of the court? Yeah, but even where? And under, under your proposal, though, where's the checks and balances? Of the, the, court? the court. No, on the government. Where's the checks and balances? But first, where well, the question. But where, but where is the government? Where is the power of government lies in Israel? If you think that the power of government lies in the Knesset, in the parliament, because we agreed yeah. with, that we are all for parliamentarian supremacy. Yeah. Then how come I did not pass the law last week? How come I have the majority? Yeah. A majority can do whatever they want. How come I did not pass? Well, if we, well we can discuss that. Uh, no, no, we, we, but I think we can discuss. I think that. the answer is in in the Talmudic dictum. I would suggest the answer is tapasta mm -hmm. tapasta. But you, you sought to go uh, so far that uh, you won't achieve anything. Uh, so, the game, I think. so the government can do it whatever it wants? Or there are checks and balances. The check to have, a, check, to have a system where the checks and balances are demonstrations in the no, sense No, system. the checks and balances, the checks and balances are the fact that we need a coalition, unlike the UK. You need a coalition. You, to, you, to have a coalition, we have. Our parties are really coalition. No, we're not. another way of looking. The no. Conservatives are such a broad church. We essentially do our coalition building before the election. You do it after. Uh, so, but under your proposals, I do so, ask so, a question on this. But where is the checks and balances of your proposals? I'm saying that the fact that in Israel you have a proportional voting and you need to have a coalition, and I think the small coalition you ever had is six or seven parties. Mm. That's, a, a, that's a check and balance. It's a big check. Right. It's but, a, just a second. But that's a check within the uh, coalition. I'm talking about extra coalition checks and balances. Where are they? So, so I understand that every answer that I will try to give, you would say that's not what I asked. I'm, you, you want me to describe the checks and balances of the government? Please let me do it. The need to have a coalition is an extremely hard check to check to pass. It means that it doesn't, and it's not enough to convince one party or one party leader to do something. I understand. So you need to. So it's a major limit on the power of a coalition right. to do anything. So what the coalition decided, where's the check and balance thereafter under your proposal? Once the, once the, the parliament in the UK decided something, where are the checks and balances? The check, I'll tell you where, I'll tell you where. Because in the UK, the government does not control the parliament. Because to get- But then what I'm explaining to you now that the government does not control the parliament in Israel also, but you ignore this. No. So I, what I'm saying, once you decide something in the parliament, once you convince someone yeah. in the UK parliament, where are the checks and balances? Because I'm to, you, your answer is, your answer is the coalition yeah, is hard to put together. No, I'm answering the question. Your answer is, well, the coalition is hard to put together. I've got to persuade the coalition. The coalition is the government. In the UK situation, if the government decides something, it doesn't mean it gets through Parliament. Let's take let's take the small votes bill, which is going to go through at the moment. That could well be voted down in the House of Commons. It will certainly have serious problems in the House of Lords, and where you the assume, government doesn't have a majority. And you assume that in Israel, whatever the government decides, the Parliament passes. But you've got a majority. But you assume that it's not true. I cannot explain. I cannot argue. Um, as, as, as you say that in, in the UK, there are situations when the government decides something and the parliament does not pass it. You know how many times it happened in Israel? Many times. So, so your premise is wrong. But is that the only check and balance? Then? But th that's what I asked. Yeah. What are the checks and balances after you convince the parliament to pass something in the UK? But I'm saying you're, you're comparing apples and oranges. No, I'm not. See, you are, because here you've got a single house parliament, right? There's no second house. In the UK, um, you've got a second house, which is not controlled uh, on, on legislation. Yeah, effectively, effectively, yes. No. Unless you unless you wait a year. Unless you use the Parliament Act. So you wait a year. Yeah, or unless you use the Parliament Act. Parliament Act. And, and even then, that is extraordinarily difficult because the legislation has been exactly the same form. Right? Parliament Act is very rarely used. And but you have the power to do you so. Do, you do if you if you spend that amount of political capital here, you don't have to do that. Well, yeah, that's what you think because you don't know our system. And I have to say, I'm sorry, 
You don't have to. You don't have to apologize. No, but you, what you're telling me that once you convince a majority in parliament to pass a legislation, you can do it. You say it will take a lot of political capital to do it. So the case in Israel, it's the same checks and balances that you have in the Westminster system of parliament. Now you have two houses. Okay, New Zealand does not have two houses, and they have the same system, and they have 120 members of parliament, single chamber. And, and politicians can... don't elect their judges. Yes, they do. Not, not in the same way. Yes, elect, not, no. Elect. Not in the same way. Who appoints the judges in New Zealand? Not, not in the same way. Who appoints the judges in New Zealand? No, there is no country in the world. No, it's not. Which is going to have the same system as Israel if these reforms go. But there is no. If you take into account the judges, it's, the parliament, I, I, and elections. David, I'm sorry to tell you that you're wrong. You've got to have um, I, I, We will never have the same system. I agree. And you need to have checks and balances, and I'm have, still waiting to hear them. No, you are not waiting, because you heard and you and you, and you ignored. I'm sorry. You don't have to apologize. No, I will apologize. You heard and you ignored. The same checks and balances that happen, that have you have in any parliamentarian system, we have in Israel. In Israel, it's way more because of the system of proportional representation. So it's harder to control parliament. You don't have a single party or two party in the, in the coalition. You have a lot more. So it's harder to pass things through the parliament. You have all the time to negotiate and invest in political capital. But put that aside for a second. In New Zealand, the, the justice minister appoints the judges. Single-handedly, he appoints the judges. Here, you will have to get compromise in a system with other members of his coalition in the committee. Past shows that the coalition does not vote as a unanimous power in the committee. So the premise that it will be easier to appoint judges once this reform is passed is just don't have anything to lie on. In Canada and in New Zealand, the justice minister appoints by himself. He doesn't need, he usually consults with people. It's an informal consultation. No one stops. It's because a convention. Because, no, but you, it also, you have a convention. So you ignore whatever you don't like or disagree with. And you say, in Israel, you have a lot of people to consult with when you appoint. Even if so you have the power of people are opposed to these reforms, it's not because they really care about the future of Israeli independent justice and democracy, it's because they're afraid of losing their agent to power and Of course, course, of course, for many, many years. And they say it openly. They say, we want that, that some of it is about the draft law, the ultra-orthodox draft law. Again, again, an example, how a minority, that is power through the parliament to get a benefit for the minority, and the court does not act on behalf of the minority rights, or equality, but it takes away from the minority whatever they got from the parliament, because minorities in Israel are stronger through the parliament than in other systems. So th that's why I'm saying that if you look at the parliamentarian system in the UK or the parliamentarian system in New Zealand, and you ask yourself, what are the checks and balances on parliament in the UK or in New Zealand? In Israel, because of the minority's representation in the parliament, you have it's harder to pass things through Parliament in Israel than in any other country that you're talking about. If you have a minority of Muslims in London, you can go around them and have the constituency drawn in a way that will limit their power. In Israel, you cannot well, do you it. Because the constituencies in Britain are independently drawn. But, I mean, we by who? By an independent commission. Because we yeah, actually that have... was enacted by an act of Parliament. Yeah, can the you... people on the commission are independent. But can you change this in an act of Parliament? Nobody votes against the Boundary Commission. Uh, Can you? Is this limit in the Constitution? Is it in the like, like you, we don't have a written. Uh, okay, so there is no limit. And it was acted by the Parliament. In the UK, the, the, the Parliament uh, um, increased its time from five to seven years in the past. In Israel, it cannot happen. Definitely not on simple majority. In the UK, it happened. So the checks and balances on Parliament in the UK. I think all... you're talking about during the Second World War. No, I'm talking about. Uh, I think it was 19th century. Oh, right. Okay. But, okay. Well, I think but, it's rather different. Now, I, actually, I want to go to some questions because we've got lots of questions. Now, how are we going to do this? Um, I was told they're going to come through on WhatsApp to me, but I haven't. Oh, right, I've just received some. Good. Right. As if by magic. 
Um, let me ask you this. I think this is a question that's been asked by quite a lot of people. Um, why the headlong rush to fundamental reform at the outset, rather than the substantive efforts to obtain more widespread agreement about the nature of the reform proposals? I think a lot of people say, you know, why, why the rush? Why so quickly? Is it because you feel that now you've got a coalition where Netanyahu has had to come with the extremist parties because the more centrist party won't sit with him because he's he's on trial himself. This is your moment. And if you don't use your moment now, it may never come back. Why the rush? Um, I think to say that the reform that people are, Yariv Levine specifically, number one in the Likud under Netanyahu, um, um, that it's hard to say extremist in politics since 2009. Um, and he's working on this reform since 2009 to say, why the rush when we're in 2023? The question is, and the people will ask the question, no rush. It's been long awaited. It wasn't the a override, bill though, and it keeps the changing. Override, the, override, the override clause was in the coalition agreement in 2015. It was trapped at the coalition agreement in 2019. Mm. That's a rush. That's not a rush. Um, what's the question is, why should it, why a change that people are talking about for more than decades, definitely two decades, um, the, the speaker of the Knesset in 2003, Rob he mm. said that you have, you need to have this change. We're talking about it for many, many years and for, and for many years, and now we are after uh, Three years, and it's five elections that were created by the instability that the court created on the older orthodox draft. So to say why the rush, we need to solve urgent issues in Israel's security, in Israel economy, in Israel attributes as a as a Jewish country, as a democratic country. But you can't be solving and, the economy with this. And the court, I mean, the economy is being hit by this, hasn't it? The, I don't think the economy was hit by this. The shekel, I mean, um, I see the shekel, it's gone from 3.8 to 4.4 against the pound in the last month. I don't know the, the pound, but I know that it's the dollar. Um, and I think that the, the shekel versus dollar went way worse um, in doing last government. So what did it cost the judicial system? You can find Korea and... Um, uh, Go away. Yeah. That's not cause, that's not a, a cause. Um, the, uh, by the way, since Netanyahu, since Netanyahu stopped um, and said we're stopping, the shekel went down. So maybe that's the reason because we stopped. We can find all this kind of uh, talking points that have nothing was to do with right reality. Thing, was it the right thing to take so, Riva and pause it? Please. I think not. I think not. I think we should have passed the bar. But always negotiate. Uh, by the way, it is not a resigning matter. You wouldn't resign because. Well, it's not about resigning. I think that if the, if the government will not pass uh, um, the judicial reform, which is in the coalition agreement, I think it will have a lot of uh, many people, many players. It's not. So, so if the prime minister said, "Come July, let's say," he said, "Look, the security situation is such and such, the economic situation is such and such, judicial reform, we're going to have to wait, say, at least two years. What would your position be there? No, I don't know. When, when we'll see, we'll, we'll see when we when we get, but I, I'm telling you quite simply, if you want to solve the economy pro problems in Israel, you have to reform the courts. If you want to solve the security issues in Israel, you have to reform the courts. Uh, the courts in Israel are interfering in Israeli security. That's not me saying. But we have That's, a defense minister. Prime Minister Rabin said it, in already in 19 in 1994, so the defense minister so resigned over this issue, um, or was fired over this issue because he asked to be determined, but right. not about this issue. Sorry, that's not true. Well, he said he said that he was concerned. He, he was, was concerned because people dragged the army into the political debate, something that you should never do, and he did not deal with it very very uh, in, in the right way. Do you, think, do you think he should that's come the back reason, into the government? Uh, that's not for me to decide. But what I'm saying is, in Israel, if you start, and by the way, we see already the bad outcomes of this approach, 
if some irresponsible players in politics or not in politics drag the IDF into the political debate, there is terrible outcomes to that. You never do that. And many people in the fight, and it wasn't the fight about the judicial reform, I'm sorry, in the fight against Netanyahu's government. And you see the people that arrange the riots. They say it openly. They say it's not about this reform, it's about taking down this government, this terrible government. Well, that, that leads me actually to a question which has also been asked on the virtual floor, uh, which is this. Um, now that discussions are taking place under the aegis of the president, um, I mean, is there a uh, possibility of a substantive compromise? Uh, or is your position really that while you might be willing to tinker with the proposals, the substantial nature of the proposals is not for discussion and has to go through it. How much are you willing to compromise? I think it's a question of compromise. I, as I said, I can take legislation offers by members of the opposition. I don't need the credit. I will sign all the legislation offers of Zev Elkin and Matan Kana from, uh, from the Machane Mamlachti uh, party. I will sign them and pass them tomorrow. There is no debate. It's not a debate about the about the judicial reform. It's a debate about the existence of the government and about democracy in Israel. So anyone who says it's about people are there is democracy on one side mm. and and dictatorship on others are cynically using the army, using the political. Uh, uh, well, I think we can both agree. I think on both sides of the debate. The rhetoric has been extended. I was I saw just before we started. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are experiencing some technical difficulties. We will try to resolve these as quickly as possible. Please bear with us. Hopefully for just a moment. There aren't enough checks and balances. Again, that's, as I, that's my answer to this question. As I said, I am more than happy to stay with a professional, 100% professional, almost 100% professional system of electing judges if they can't cancel legislation. Uh, uh, it's okay. It's not a problem. The problem is that they, it's, and then also that they, you need to have standing, that you can't go directly with any issue you want to the Supreme Court. That, uh, well, I like you on that as well. So in the UK, so, so, we've already, I mean, we've already also changing our rules on standing. I'll just ask you one thing, because we, we, I don't want to keep you too late. You've had a very, very full day. You've been very generous uh, with your time. But on, um, on, on the uh, review of legislation uh, uh, point, um, do you think the way that the Knesset passes and can also amend basic laws should change? In other words, if there was a more formal and index procedure for a basic law, maybe it had to be passed with a supermajority, then those basic laws would better serve as a quasi-constitutional law. Because at the moment, as I understand it, they're treated as based on constitutional laws, but they can be passed that, and amended like any other. This question, which you asked now, answers the question about the overall. Because once you, uh, what's happening now is the court tells you, you cannot legislate this law because in the 90s, you passed a law in the majority of 32 Knesset members versus 21 that says the other way is in my eye. And I tell him, no, you're wrong. That's not the right interpretation of the basic law. But you're not, you're not proposing, as I just, understand it, any change just to second. the basic law procedure. Just a second. Do you think you should add that in? Just a second. And the court tells me that because it's a basic yeah. law that was passed by 32 Knesset members, I cannot legislate now with 80 Knesset mm -hmm. members. And you cancel laws that I'm passing now with 60, 61 or 80 Knesset members. And you tell me that in order to override an interpretation of a basic law that was passed by 32 Knesset member, I would need more than 61. Does it make sense? It does not make sense. Not democratically, not constitutional thinking, doesn't make any sense. So I do think that a basic law that was passed in a, in a very special way should get some, in some supremacy over regular laws. I do think that's the case. And I do offer this. And I offered it will be, and I took it's not part of the package at the moment. It's not because we took it out. Is it worth putting it back in? Because I think if you put it back in, no, they, that was that was the part that raised a lot of controversy because they said if you put the the, the what the standard was for the for last uh, uh, when the uh, justice Min, justice ministry offered to have 
61 in all three readings. That's all. No, 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 that's terrible. You can pass everything with 61 majority. Apparently not, but that's what they're playing. So you need to have an extra majority. How come? How, why would you? And what is the, what is the democratic um, justification for majority in a certain Knesset? Limit majority of other Knesset. It does not make any sense. Again, if you have super majority referendum, maybe. But if you have a regular majority, passes a law that will limit next Knesset from changing it to a regular majority, mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. And if by all by some political coincidence you got eighty, then is it fair to limit to 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 limit next Knesset or even this Knesset in the majority of eighty? Does not make any sense when you look at parliamentary supremacy. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't think it's a good idea. You might need to have what you need two consecutive Knesset to change a basic law. That might make sense. The problem is that you need to make this basic law mm. begin with. So exactly. you need, you need to, to find a way to start. I think that's been by the Israeli Democracy Institute, I think. That's no, the Israeli Democratic, Democratic Institute. It, Con it, contrary to their name, probably not contrary the to their name, they offered, yeah. believe it or not, that you would be able to have a minority government in the parliamentary system. Well, we can in, in the UK. You can, yeah. We have, we have been, no, no minority governments. I mean, there's never minority government, provided you get your budget through. Ah, okay. Yeah. They, they know that even without budgets. Right. Oh, so, government can't function without a budget. Uh, but, appar apparently, the, apparently, the Israeli Democratic Institute will be okay. Okay, well, I'm not speaking for them. Let, let, me, let me end with one thing, because I think we, we do need to wrap up. It's been a really interesting discussion. I have had a really interesting discussion. I wonder how much of what we've been discussing when you look at it in a historical context, it's really unfinished business from 1948, 1949, when there was a proposal to have a written constitution. As you know, there were discussions, committees, on and off for a few years, in the end, petered out and didn't, didn't go anywhere. Do you think there's a way forward, quite separate from the day-to-day -day political issues, of having a cross-party, plus independent constitutional experts mission to think about actually writing a constitution for Israel, which might actually sort out some of these issues on a more long-term basis, or is that politically impossible? I think that might be a great idea. Politically impossible because, because, it, because the, the holy grail for the left in Israel is the Supreme Court. They look at it as a church, not as a party. They uh, look at it religious. Um, but from your point of view then, you would you you yourself would be in favor of that. Because let's say the left changed their approach, assuming that is their approach, I don't know. Do you have any objections in principle to I think working Israel towards a written constitution? I think Israel needs a procedural constitution. I'm talking about something different there. I, I understand. Yeah. I think Israel needs a procedural constitution. I think that any constitution with substance and values um, will either get you into an endless debate. Um, I think that the debate on values in the Jewish tradition continues now for more than 3,000 years, I don't think we can resolve it in three or four months, or not even three or four years. Um, and I think that if you will make the decision-making process, of what is according to the constitution or not, and you will put it in the hands of judges, you will make, you will disrupt parliamentarian supremacy, which is important to lower tensions. Parliaments lower tensions. Courts create tensions because if, if they decide on political issues. That's why it's very, and to take away the values, the important values. Ladies and gentlemen, please bear with us. Uh, we are again experiencing technical difficulties. Hopefully get this resolved momentarily. Thank you. Big applause. That's why a written constitution is valued. It gives the power to judge it to decide. Well, we'll just make the tension in Israel larger as we see on the streets today.
Well, let's let me finish with this because you've been extremely generous with your time and thank you. I mean, the upside of all of this is that people are talking about important issues like constitutions, judges, the judicial process, that's good. Uh, people are demonstrating on the streets and unlike many other cities around the Middle East, um, the police are not opening fire, people can demonstrate freely and Israeli democracy is vibrant uh, and healthy and I think we both agree that's absolutely critical and we want it to continue. So let me finish by thanking you very much. You're right, this conversation probably is a 3,000 year conversation for Jews. Uh, it will continue, I hope, uh, with a lot of vigour uh, on both sides. You've been very generous with your time. Thank you very much Thank for you. joining us. And uh, good night, as they say, from Jerusalem. Thank you very much. This concludes our evening's Zoom presentation. Thank you, Lloyd Wolfson and Mr. Rothman for this most interesting conversation. Thank you to everyone in our audience for joining us tonight. A video recording of this evening's conversation will be posted to our website and social media in due course. We look forward to you joining us for future AIA events, both online and in person here in London. Thank you again and good night.